We follow in the footsteps of those who walked the line before us. They fought and sacrificed. Some died, building what we have today. This is their legacy and our heritage, a thin green line stretching back more than a century and a half, running through every prison, linking us together on the toughest beat in the state. If I had anything to say um, to the officers that have, that have given their lives in the past for this profession, uh, to keep the public safe and to, and to serve the public, uh, in my eyes there is no greater honor than that. Um, and to the people that have done what they've done to get our union to the point that it has, um, to protect our officers, uh, to them wholeheartedly, all I can extend is, is thank you very, very much. I have been a correctional officer for less than two years. I love asking officers with many years in the department what their opinions um, are about how things have changed and how things used to be. Just based on the, inc the stories of the incidents alone, what they were subjected to without the equipment, what they, um, I, I work alongside many officers that have scars to this day. Um, and those scars are not, not just physical, they're emotional and they're still in there doing the job. When I was a young officer, obviously, I was told the war stories by the, the old timers and, uh, and things were different at that point. Uh, we didn't have uh, side handle batons, we didn't have pepper spray, uh, we didn't have vests. Uh, we used to do cell extractions with a mattress. One of my very favorites who's been sharing a lot of stories with me since I've been um, the Bravo 2 dining cop is he has scars, he's been stabbed and um, he has been injured by inmates and he has an incredible spirit. I respect him as much as I respect anybody on the front lines of a war. My first day at on Preston, the whole, the whole uh, hill went off, all five hills went up, and then they start fighting, and all you can see was the, the tear gas going off. What made you get involved in this, my type of work? Do you do it's it all of those yourself? wonderful stories from <laughs> Preston. <laughs> All of those wonderful war stories that, that occurred and um, how active the place sounded um, just sparked my interest. It was a good job. Yeah, I was gone for a, long, a few days there, uh, evenings. Maybe 10 years, 10 years on evenings. Uh, I didn't see much of you. What the heck made my daughter come into this type of profession? I had to be. Uh, you I did it all yourself. Yes, I did. And uh, that, that gave me gave me the, the, the pride to say she did it all herself because I didn't help you, but it also gave me the opportunity to tell other members that asked for help if I didn't help my daughter because she needed to learn how to do it by herself. She did it. You got to do it. So that's why today you set the tone for everybody else in the Youth Authority or even uh, part of CDCR. I remember my first day, the first thing they said, you Walker's kid, huh? You know, we, we actually never really talked about what you did for a living. And all I, I thought you were like a youth, youth playground supervisor or something, because all I ever saw was a whistle. <laughs> and during the, the early part of the career, it, uh, it was rough. There were a lot of changes going on. We were looking at uh, battling against getting equipment for for line staff, which we didn't have to to defend ourselves, and yeah, what kind of, it, yeah, it wasn't anything to talk about at home. Believe me, <laughs> if you could just get home. I think my dad's passion for his work at, for for CCPOA was always very evident, um, and uh, now that I'm working with CCPOA and and, and you know, uh, sort of proudly following in his footsteps, I feel the same passion. Um, I, I now sort of have a better understanding. You know, I, I know that there are a lot of parent offspring in CCPOA, and it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of our members have had similar experiences, which is, you know, they didn't know what the heck their kid was going to do, and then all of a sudden, the daughter, the son, says, I'm going to do what my parents have been doing. And that's a pretty good feeling, too. The very early years of CCPOA, 78, 79, was prior to collective bargaining. 
Well, my job was running the printer. There was only three employees, and uh, we were more uh, a social club than we were actively involved in anybody's representation. If you saw the benefit in the organization and the meaningful representation we wanted to provide, then you got in your car and you spent your money on your gas and you stood at the gate of a prison and you passed out flyers that you might have paid Kinko's to make the copies for you. It was all on your own dime. Most of the changes that, that I would class as positive have, have come about either directly uh, from CCPO intervention uh, or indirectly from CCPO intervention. Uh, we, we've uh, been staunch advocates over the years for better training, uh, longer academies, uh, better requirements or sh more stringent requirements uh, to get hired on with uh, background checks, uh, psychological evaluations, etc. Uh, so I, I, I think CCPOA has been uh, extremely successful uh, in those arenas long before I got here uh, and, and will continue to be long after I'm gone. Part of that is uh, the increased professionalization of the organization. You folks walk the toughest beat in the state and that increased professionalism and you know the RTB thing uh, has allowed the organization as I say to be run by members instead of hired guns one uh, and two uh, it makes a heck of a team. I think our, our real value has been that our our officers understand they they want they want each other to be trained they care about a person that has their back they uh, they care to the point that if the state isn't willing to provide the training for the officers we would do it it has always been that we will do what we can to convince the employer to take care of their employees because it is their responsibility. The advocacy of the union has, has made some phenomenal strides uh, in the area of benefits and pay. You know, we had days where they were, they were stopping everybody at the control center <laughs> automatically, every day, without fail, whether there was any emergency or not. And we stood there for 15 minutes, minimum, and no one got paid for it. Well, the, but the union got involved, and the, just like you told the sergeant last night, you want a false sheet, the, all of a sudden that came into play, and we started asking for false sheets to sign in for those 15 minutes, and that mandatory 15-minute hole all of a sudden disappeared. With the union, I feel like we really do. I think that they, you know, we, the officers have a voice um, through the union. I believe that. But those rights were rights that we worked for. All of those. I mean, for the 25 years that I've been in the department, the history and the right to bargain over working conditions and safety equipment. All of those things are things that we had to fight for because they didn't exist back then. The department is different. Um, and part of it is CCPOA pushing for rules for workers' comp and other things and consistency and standards. Back in the old days, I would consider an individual contact or one hour counseling on a ward just in the, in this, in, in just checking them and checking them or searching them before he went into the unit. Um, I would talk to him about his pants. We do I a little more in-depth conversation now. Well, that was that, yeah, I know. But that's how we did our, our small groups back then. It's like, okay, we had a small group. Get in there, sit down, be quiet. There's mandates. The counseling, they're mandated. Um, an hour of individual contact in a week. However, they need to talk to their caseloads daily. Um, they spend uh, three hours mandated in uh, specific counseling groups um, per the mandates. Um, you're constantly, constantly talking to them. I think